The COVID-19 pandemic has shaken global powers as well as affected Africa's development prospects and worsened the conditions of its poor and vulnerable. Though there are calls for voluntary international aid to support the continent during the difficult times, and some already gotten, there are arguments that this is far from the solution. There have also been calls for the continent of Africa to be accorded damages and liability compensation from China. One of those who shared his school of thought is former vice president for the Africa region at the World Bank and the former minister of education for Nigeria. She is a co-convener of the Nigeria's hashtag Bring Back Our Girls movement, Obi Ezekweseli. She now joins us via Skype to throw more light on this. Thank you, Dr. Obi, for joining us on News on the Hour. Thank you very much. And how are you doing this morning, ma'am? I am doing great. <laughs> Good Thanks. to see you. Now, let's, let's go, let's refer to your Washington Post, the article in, your Washington, in the Washington Post. You did state unequivocally clear that China must have called the African continent damages and liability compensation and by inference, a reparation. Why do you express such an arguable view, ma'am? Well, um, you know, each time that um, a global risk happens, and originates from an advanced economy, and there is no accountability for it, uh, there is always a tendency that another global, uh, and another advanced economy will similarly behave recklessly, and yet again, there would be no consequence and no accountability. And each time that we have studied uh, who the bad behavior of advanced economies affects the most, um, during and after the, uh, the, 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 the risk has materialized, it's often the poor and vulnerable countries and their citizens. And um, you find a situation where if you think in terms of uh, the um, climate uh, variabilities, the climate change, the whole um, you know, uh, gas, gas emission and uh, the, the effect that it's had on, 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 on the climate, Africa contributed some less than maybe 1%. Uh, to, to this, uh, the, uh, the greenhouse emission, um, but Africa suffers an in, a disproportionate impact of that on its economy because the indus industrialized economies uh, created most of the problems. Uh, and then you look at uh, the uh, financial crisis that became an economic crisis in 2008-2009, uh, Africa had no hand in it. It originated in, uh, the, um, in the U.S. and then um, U.K. and uh, Europe. But Africa suffered the worst impact. I was uh, in the midst of that storm at that time because I, I was vice president uh, for Africa region at the World Bank. And so I had to work with uh, our countries on the continent, sub-Saharan Africa, to try to uh, cushion the effect of that um, crisis. And now we have uh, the health pandemic. And uh, what do you think has happened? Africa is suffering the most in terms of the economic and social impact of, of, this, um, of the pandemic uh, that it did not create. And when you look at it, um, it is very clear that there's a lot of opacity or opaqueness associated with the way that uh, the advanced economy this time that has created it, China, has conducted its, uh, uh, itself. So in my article, I make a very strong point that it is necessary for us to now uh, set a standard whereby there would be a global risk burden tax that must be paid countries like Africa when advanced economies behave uh, in ways that uh, show that they haven't taken full responsibility and it has had an impact right. on the poor and the vulnerable. Okay. Now, China seems to be taking the, the, the fall on many sides. As just last week, Saturday here, uh, the president of the U.S., Donald Trump, warned that China should face consequences if it was knowingly responsible for unleashing the coronavirus pandemic. And just yesterday, um, Germany, like France and the UK and the US, have also directed its coronavirus anger at China after a major newspaper put together uh, a 130 billion pound invoice that Beijing owes Berlin following the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. Now, in your opinion, do, do you think they knowingly, uh, they are knowingly, uh, were knowingly responsible for this or it was just a mistake on the, on the side of China? We don't know the full details yet, but, you know, based on uh, the, the knowns and the, the fact that you can see uh, gaps in, in, the, in the information disclosed to the world uh, on this pandemic uh, by the Chinese authorities, it is clear that there is something that could have been there. There could have been a sharing of information that would enable the world 
uh, handle this better. China could have handled this better uh, on behalf of the rest of the world. How is it that you know this uh, this situation uh, just sort of um, cut the the world by by some kind of surprise? And it seemed as if information has been suppressed as to the scale of impact that the virus even had in China. Only some few days ago, China told us they were revising uh, the data of uh, people who had died as a result of the pandemic uh, by as much as 50%. So there is so much that is yet unknown. There is a, 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 an obvious lack of transparency in what has been communicated. And, 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 and so in my article, I also make the very strong point that it is necessary for China to agree to the uh, uh, setting up of an independent panel of experts uh, that would evaluate uh, the whole um, uh, uh, activities surrounding uh, the the um, outset or the, the the onset of the of this uh, of this um, pandemic. All right, now, there have been calls for voluntary international aid to support the continent during this difficult time. Don't you think this is the best solution so far? It is not the best solution because, um, you know, I, as, I, as I told you, my track record shows that I know uh, what I talk about in terms of uh, the global community as far as uh, international development is concerned. Um, you would, um, you know, when you have this kind of a situation, uh, you, would, you would have a marginal increase in the amount of uh, development assistance that countries can give. It doesn't often scratch the surface much, and therefore it does not take countries that have suffered the shocks uh, coming from uh, the crisis, um, you know, economic shocks and uh, social shocks, uh, upheavals, and many other uh, related shocks. It doesn't, food shocks uh, sometimes follow. Um, it doesn't often, what, whatever marginal increment that you get from development assistance, because it is voluntary. Uh, some big countries can decide to give a little bit. Some other countries, their domestic constituencies tell them, you shouldn't be donating, we are also suffering. So you're left to the, um, uh, to the, uh, the whims and the caprices or the benevolence of, uh, of uh, the rest of the world. And so that kind of assistance really doesn't go to the root of the matter, which is that when that crisis uh, came upon you, something you did not create, it, it shut you down in terms of your growth trajectory. When you look at uh, the, um, the global financial crisis, at the time it happened, uh, Africa was already growing at, on a steady part basis of 5% uh, annually and was on its uh, way toward a 6% average growth annually when they, uh, it struck. And because it struck, Africa's growth collapsed to below 2%. And since that period, it's been struggling to find its way back up to where it originally was. And now it was beginning to get toward 3%. And now again, it's shut down. And it's going to go to a contraction of almost 4% of its GDP. Now, this is totally not acceptable. The poor can't keep paying for the recklessness of the rich, richer countries. And we cannot then, um, you know, end up uh, being uh, grateful to them for helping us, supposedly. That kind of, of help is uh, seriously undermining of uh, the continent's uh, economic growth and development. And I, I absolutely want Africa to assert itself I want an Africa that is assertive, that, that, that simply says, we're not going to take this anymore. Let there be a conversation about this and let there be some action. The global risk burden tax that I have proposed is a penalty for bad behavior. Because, you know, in the global systems, we often, um, as a custom, uh, re 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 expect that the uh, more advanced countries, more advanced economies have a higher probability of checking, uh, of preventing, of understanding, of anticipating, being proactive and preemptive of risks and that where risks materialize to have the capacity 
inherently to be able to manage the risks in the kind of way that they would not create serious negative externalities for the rest of the world. Uh, Dr. Every Obi, time that that does in, not in happen, still, yes, it's it, terrible. Dr. Obi, in your article, you also did say that China could have been more transparent about the whole situation. Now, how, what would you suggest China should have done by way of transparency and acting responsibly and effectively to manage this global catastrophe? I think that one of the key things that we talk about in transparency is full disclosure. You don't disclose in part. You totally just do full disclosure because you know that an epidemic in your environment uh, will not be, um, you know, it, it, it has a very high probability of going across the border. And so the people across the other uh, your body needs to be quite immediately on, on, on top of it so that they, there is no chance that you would have instances where the many uh, citizens of other countries that uh, were going in and coming out of China all through December and maybe even November uh, would, they would just be blind to the fact that, uh, that you know, something, something's growing. You know? so, so full disclosure is so at the heart of the transparency when it comes to uh, uh, health-related issues. Um, and global surveillance systems are, are, are supposed to immediately kick in when that kind of food disclosure happens. We will know more when we have this team of independent experts. But I don't want to live in a world where we don't get to know the full details of what happened, because then we, 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 we just put ourselves at risk that another Thing would happen again without our knowing what it was that we did not do well uh, as the whole world or as a specific country uh, in the previous time. And then we'll go ahead and repeat it again. It is not now that we should be so ignorant of the ways that we can tackle uh, problems. There are many solutions to problems that the world faces today. All right. Now, Dr. Orby, do you think this economic um, shock caused by the coronavirus pandemic has reduced the opportunity Africa would have otherwise have had to leave hundreds of its millions of people out of poverty? And if yes, what is pertinent for us to do at this point in time? Well, it is uh, the, 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 the a key thing is, of course, that you are no longer with the kind of fiscal space. When we say fiscal space, it means the envelope of financial, public financial resources or, you know, complemented by private uh, uh, investment to be able to carry on the kind of investment that your economy needs in order to generate growth and tackle poverty. Uh, and, and when you don't have that, it means that you're not going to see private sector leading your growth effort. And when private sector is not leading your growth effort, it means that unemployment is going to be higher. I mean, the Africa Union Commission uh, did an estimate of uh, the kinds of the amount of uh, jobs that would be lost as a result of this pandemic and came out with 20 million jobs lost. I mean, you can't deal with this because every year already for the continent, an average of 11 to 12 million young people enter the labor market. Now, uh, according to current data, it will be less, uh, maybe less than 12% of them that end up with, uh, you know, a, a, what we call decent jobs. The rest of them are on the unemployment uh, line. Now you want to add as a result of a pandemic, some 200, uh, some 20 million uh, of, uh, to, to, to your existing numbers. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have to do this. So the continent needs to find that shot in the arm that enables it to expand the fiscal space that has narrowed significantly. Because, for example, in the case of Nigeria, the oil shock instantly has meant a collapse of the public expenditure because uh, and, and some six, uh, 70 to 75 percent of public budget is from oil. And, and, and so it is with all the other countries, two thirds of African countries have one form of natural endowment or the other that is a, a core part of its budget. So it needs to deal with that. Then the second thing is that Africa has the opportunity now to really focus on a, a, a development strategy that is it sans natural resources. You cannot depend on natural resources. It's not something you control. Every sh global shock affects it. Uh, for as long as production systems shut down, 
or there, there is a collapse of the demand side, you are going to be affected. So we need to find our pathway in a more serious way. People give this very, um, red, um, um, you know, uh, 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 what you call lip service to the matter of uh, structurally changing the composition of Africa's economy. But then they don't follow through with the right sets of policies, the right kinds of investments, and the right kinds of institutions that would enable Africa be a low-cost environment that attracts uh, uh, private investment, both from its citizens as well as from outsiders. Uh, the, the, the third part is that Africa needs to understand that um, you know, poverty destabilizes. Because poverty destabilizes, it, it, it starts it by creating social tensions and, and inability to, to have governance systems that are accountable to the citizens that emphasize the importance of social contract between those that govern and those that they govern ends up creating so much schism Yes. within the environment. And so it becomes even much more difficult okay. to mobilize the citizens behind a rallying vision when there is crisis. These now, are now, all okay. things that Africa must change. OK. Now, now Doctor, there, there are rising cases of um, COVID-19 in, in Nigeria as it is presently. Now, in your opinion, what do you think the NCDC and the federal government should be focusing on doing right now to, to at least save, save still the myriads of Nigerians who, who are potentially exposed to contracting this virus? I think that testing, 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 because um, in, in many of the countries where the wave, we've seen the wave of, of this viral, uh, of, of, its, of, the, of the virus's uh, life as, uh, uh, cycle, we, we know that if you can detect through testing, you can separate, that is, you can isolate, and then you can care for. Uh, we, in the caring for aspect, it is going to be Im almost impossible. We simply don't have the kind of uh, strong health systems to enable us do that. So uh, we don't have the health personnel, we don't have the, uh, the health infrastructure, we don't even have the, health le the, the level of health expertise that can uh, operate on that. So prevention is a low cost solution to this, which therefore means that everything that the NCDC uh, is doing needs to be scaled in the area of testing. Uh, because when you test, then you can quickly locate and you can identify. Uh, the, the, the second thing is that it's not just NCDC. It's the fact that there are economic implications for the kinds of solutions that we have. In other words, you, you have a trade-off sometimes between the health need as well as the economic need. We have more than 70% of our people who survive on a daily wage. Uh, they are not going to have, find it funny to be told that you know, they are on a lockdown when there is no, 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 no substitution effect for them. As in, you know, if you're going to cut me off from my source of earning, then somebody must be stepping in to, to help me cushion this effect. Oh, we right, haven't done that very well. Right. And so we're in a tricky uh, catch-22 situation. Uh, we need to coordinate the matter of emergency relief, uh, economic uh, 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 support programs better than we're currently doing. Um, then you look at the fact that the individual citizens have a role to play in all of these, uh, mobilizing them and continuing to, uh, you know, use moral suasion as much as you use uh, the carrots of incentives uh, through uh, the palliatives that you're, you're providing uh, from your fiscal activities to persuade them to say, guys, we have to all hang together. This thing can destroy the entire society. You know, you have to be alive uh, and, and then be hungry. All right, know? Dr. So Obi, we, 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 have to, we have to let you leadership. go now, Dr. I want to say thank you. It's been great having you join us on News on Hour, Dr. Obi Ezekwesili. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And keep keeping safe.